All right, so today we're going to talk about some NFL news. Uh, Dallas Cowboys have a new head coach. Uh, Rams lose a coach. Um, Tua is going into the draft, and we're going to talk about some playoffs. So let's start with the headliner, and that is uh, Mike McCarthy, former uh, Green Bay Packers head coach, has agreed to become the new Cowboys head coach. Um, uh yeah, so that hasn't been made official, but that's what all the reports are. Mike McCarthy himself said it. So <laughs> we'll see exactly what that means uh, going forward when Jerry Jones does his press conference and everything. Um, for me, it's interesting. So I said that was my pick, uh, not necessarily because uh, the best fit or anything. I think there's some things you can get into as far as talking about the best fit for a coach with the current roster and all that good stuff. Um, but for me, it's really about um, the general situation of it. There's a lot of talk about Lincoln Riley and I already went off about college coaches and all that on the last episode. But um, for me, it's just looking at this roster, you have a very talented roster, a lot of resources put into it. Um, obviously the pieces are there. So for me, it wasn't about bringing in somebody that was going to have a learning curve, but you seem to think, or not you, but, uh, the media seems to continue to think, and some fans continue to think that this whole NFL is about getting a, a coach that's just going to sit there and hold your quarterback's hand. And that is not the case. And I'm glad Dallas was smarter than that because, whole Lincoln Riley and they were talking about Dak's old coach from Mississippi State like come on now seriously to run an NFL team a and one that can possibly be a playoff contender next year so uh, to me it was quite simple it was get a coach that's established that's a veteran that you know will do a good job so Mike McCarthy was probably the best name out there uh, as far as experience and resume and so um, it'll be interesting to see how that all kind of gels. Now, Cowboys have one of the most distinct uh, situations because of the owner. Like, I don't care about the America's team and Jerry's world and all that. Like, whatever. Like, you could every team has a spotlight on it. I think having the owner make personnel decisions and be that involved, that's where it's tricky. And so... It's been Jason Garrett for a long time, and he's an in-house type of guy. So having somebody from outside is going to be interesting to see how long this lasts. Uh, whether or not McCarthy wins, I want to see if he can stand being there. It's just interesting to me. But that was my pick because, as I mentioned, I think he's the one that could get the most out of the roster as far as getting them to be disciplined getting them to uh, be professional assignment sound. Not to say Jason Garrett wasn't there, but, you know, sometimes um, you you realize that the voice just isn't carrying the weight that you thought it might. And when it comes to the on-the-field product that falls on the head coach, especially when it's mistakes that take you out and inconsistencies, and especially when you got guys that everybody can tell you is talented. And so with all that talent, you should be able to do something. And so um, I don't think uh, Jerry Jones did a poor job building this roster at all. I think he did a very good job putting talent on the roster. So, um, you know, Jason Garrett had those shots to get it done and he didn't. And that's the other thing I take away from it is that that's how I would always rather see that for my Bears or any other team. I would rather see the Steelers approach. I would rather see the Bengals approach. I would rather see the Dallas approach because everybody wants to continue to talk about what people are and what people aren't after a, the smallest sample size. You got people, and it's all sports media fault, not all their fault, but that's a big part of it. Social media is a big part of it. And I've talked about this a lot, but it's just like one game or one week or one season. This person is this. This person, like they were like Deshaun Watson got hurt. Um, I forgot how many games he played in his rookie season, but people were talking about he's the face of the NFL. Like what? He didn't even play a whole season. 
And then, of course, you didn't see Mahomes that year. And then Mahomes comes out next year. Well, of course, he's the he's the this and he's the that. And Sean McVay and then this person and that person. It's just like everybody wants to start giving everybody a title before they even put in the body of work. And so i rather see it this way where you have uh, Jason Garrett, where when you make this decision, you can honestly say, you giving him chances and you've seen him over time. So whether it's an injury, a fluke injury or bad luck or a tough schedule or bad roster, it doesn't matter because when you have that many seasons, it all evens out. You know, all the variables even out because you've had so many chances to do it. And now you can say for sure this is the type of coach you are. Marvin Lewis, same thing. You had that many years. And you never, never made it to it. You could say this is the type of coach you are. But when you're firing Freddie Kitchens after one year, even though it was a bad hire, when you're firing Shermer after two years, when you're firing these people, like just turning them in and out, then you never get to say what type of coach they are. And so um, I always rather have it this way. And so I, I commend the Cowboys for giving him the time to show what he can do. And and Jason Garrett understands probably at this point he he just he's not that great of a head coach. All right, so speaking of the wheels falling off, <laughs> so we move over to Wade Phillips. Now, this is just the latest thing in the Rams uh dismantling. So you had Jared Goff really fall off this year and i'm not saying he's a but i'm not i'm not i'm not into labels if you're new to this channel that i don't do that stuff um it's all circumstantial so but his production fell off and noticeably fell off fell off excuse me but honestly the few times i watched jared golf his issues aren't anything new that we haven't seen before and so the o-line production definitely fell off as those guys are getting older in the tooth they're primarily run blockers, and we're starting to see, like, um, you know, their pass protection not hold up as well. Uh, of course, Ty Gurley with the degenerative knee issue and the defense, you lost, uh, well, you brought in Jalen Ramsey, but you lost some star power, and the defense didn't produce what it used to, and you lost games, and now the defensive coordinator's leaving, so... You're seeing a lot of a lot of the wheels come off, and uh, I keep wanting to call him St. Louis in Los Angeles. So, um, and I take no pleasure in that. I think uh, Sean McVay, from the things I've seen, I think he's uh, a, a good coach. Um, I don't know a whole lot of his particulars, but I think he's a smart guy, and he's definitely a student of the game. However, this is what I was talking about. You're naming and branding and uh, crowning, <laughs> crowning people before they even do anything. And it's fine to say he's coach of the year. You, that's a voted award. It's fine to say, wow, he beat expectations. He's a real good coach. The thing is, the media does what it always does. Social media does what it does. And it blew it way out of proportion. It's just like he's the next gene. He's the boy genius. He's the boy. He's such a genius. It's everybody needs a Sean McVay. Do it the Sean McVay way. He's such. He's a quarterback whisperer. He fixed Jared Goff, and it was so dumb. It was dumb for a lot of reasons. And so again, it's nothing against him. It's the narrative that people created around them. And now again, I'm not saying that he's bad. I'm not saying golf is bad. I'm not saying the team is bad, but it's always a matter of execution and circumstances and people want to make it seem like everything's a constant. Nothing's a constant in the NFL. There's very few players that are constants. Most are, uh, you know, uh, products of the environment, products of the situation, you know, products of an easy schedule product of a, a break from a flag or somebody getting injured or, you know, a uh, coach that just fits right with the player. Like, it's always a product of something. And so now, as I said, when you get to see it over years, test it over years, then you get to see what really is what. And so we, the jury's still out for me 
but you're seeing all these things that people are going nuts over kind of fall off. And now the, one of the biggest things was that this whole system of I'm the head coach, but I only deal with the quarterback and offense. And then I bring in a defensive guy to run everything on defense. And it's basically like we got two head coaches. So uh, I don't mind it. I don't mind it. Um, and it's not to say that it hasn't been done that way before, but this is one of the most explicit ways that it was done, like publicly. And so uh, we have a similar situation in Chicago. Teams have started to look at that. But um, now people are seeing that part of it fall off. So, again, I don't think it's a problem with the structure. It's just, you know, what happens with the production. But I wonder if people are now going to look at it like, oh, well, maybe this system doesn't work. And so because, you know, people on trends. So uh, Wade Phillips has bounced back. He's been bouncing back his whole career. So I'm not worried about him. But uh it's interesting when they can just say, okay, you're fired, and um, we'll see what they do going forward with the defense. All right, so the playoffs. Playoffs? Uh, so uh, let's see. I don't remember. I think I might have been 2-2. Two and two. Yeah, I think I was. So Houston, I picked them. Uh, it was a lot closer than I was thinking it was going to be. Uh, pick New England, of course, they lost. I picked uh, the Saints, and they lost, and I picked the Seahawks. So, yep, split down the middle. Um, so, two overtime two overtime games, excuse me, and some very close games. So, let me kind of go through and uh, break it, uh, do a little recap or whatever reaction to it. So, uh, the Houston-Buffalo game, and I already know how this is going to go from – everybody but whatever uh this is my opinion this was a tough game to watch this was such a sloppy game and uh some people were like oh it's a defensive battle it really wasn't i mean there was some good defense being played don't get me wrong but there's a difference when players are getting off blocks and making tackles in the backfield or a player breaks on the ball and knocks the ball out. Or a player is in tight coverage and you got nowhere to throw the ball. Or players get off a block with a nice pass rush and sack somebody. You know, that that's a defensive battle. When the defense is imposing their will. When the offense is fumbling themselves or dropping passes or not on the same page and throwing the ball where the route's not going or throwing inaccurate passes and defense just makes easy plays on it or getting sacked after running around for five seconds and just making it a coverage sack that's different that's not a defensive battle that's sloppy offense and that's what you saw in this game look I get look I will give Deshaun Watson all the credit in the world for uh, keeping the composure and having the heart. And he's a gamer. He's an absolute gamer. We knew that. He's a gamer. He has the heart. He'll come back and he'll keep clawing and fighting. The whole thing with, <laughs> I kept seeing, and it's mostly Bears fans, but I kept seeing people just like, he broke those sacks and they're just like, see, that's what a top pick does. What? Yeah, I can name a lot of top picks that can't do that. Like, it, that's what happens. You just keep fighting. I mean, it, it's a it's a middle of the play. Okay, so anyway, he did that and he kept fighting back. He, he continued to make plays. I like that. But to also just ignore how he was playing before that is crazy. I mean, even outside of that long bomb to uh, Hopkins, which was impressive because he got hit. And he kind of just put it up, but to have the arm strength to put the ball that far what, with no legs, that was definitely impressive. But uh, you could tell that that could have went a lot of different ways. Um, but outside of that, he started to pick it up with some more safer passes because before that, it was just him running around. I just I couldn't believe I was sitting there with my friend watching. I was just like just counting the number of times he started running around and people really 
incorrectly judge O line sometimes. Not to say that the Texans is a great O line, but you got Laramie Tunsil, who everybody kept telling me he's such a pro bowler. Um, but anyway, you're going up against one of the, the better uh, pass rushing teams, so I understand. But even that, it wasn't every time that, okay, they were just flying in. The thing is, he was making it worse when you run around. Like, you got to understand how to manipulate a pocket. When you start moving to certain spaces, you're making it easier for the defense because the offensive line doesn't know where you are. The offensive line expects you to be within that pocket. When you start trying to break out of the pocket or run around, you make it easier for the defensive line. If you go backwards or side to side, you make it easier for the defensive lineman. And a lot of times that and people are like, oh, the completion percentage was nice. That's because he didn't pass the ball a lot. There were so many times that he just took off and got a yard or got sacked. You see how many times he got sacked? And they're like, oh, the, the pass pro was bad. No, he was just running around. He was getting himself sacked many times. And so it was just like he refused to throw the ball away, refused to throw the ball just wanting to continue to extend plays. And that's one of the things I don't like with these new mobile quarterbacks. So um, it was it was very sloppy to begin with. Just drive after drive, it was just punts and punts. And then Buffalo, they ran downhill nicely. But uh, at the same time, when it was time to actually throw the ball, when they weren't running or doing trick plays, when it was time to throw the ball, then you really saw what Josh Allen is made of. And look, I haven't watched Buffalo on any national games this year, but I heard they were winning. I heard Josh Allen this and that. And I'm like, look, I could already guess how they're doing it because Josh Allen is not that type of quarterback. He wasn't when he came out, and I doubt that he just all of a sudden became one. And sure enough, watching it, his accuracy is terrible. His accuracy is so bad. He has a cannon for an arm, definitely can run, and he's a big dude, but his accuracy is so bad. And so, like I said uh, in my uh, community post, like the playoffs, that's where your defense and quarterbacks get exposed. That's that's where you go to get exposed. You have to make plays from the pocket, and you have to stop the run, or you're going to lose. And you saw the few big plays for both teams, uh, when they really needed it, they had to come from the pocket. So there was a few that Josh Allen made and that they needed to make. And then uh, Deshaun Watson made a good number of them as they got towards the end when he finally started having to stay in the pocket and try to make throws. Because, look, you can't run all day because you're going to get hit. And eventually you're going to get stopped and it's just you're not going to move down the field running all day and you can't escape all day and never throw the ball because then you're not gaining any yards. So eventually when you're talking about people coming across the field on long plays or big posts or vertical plays, you have to be in the pocket when that happens. You can't roll out and make that play. You can't uh, scramble around and throw cross body and make that play. You have to be in the pocket to make those uh, deep down the field throws. And so once they start doing that, that's what kept them in the game. All right. So New England, Tennessee, uh, sad to see Tom Brady get eliminated like that, man. I know a lot of people are happy, which, you know, whatever people hate the Patriots, but I really enjoyed this game. Um, it was physical and I don't even mind that, uh, Tannehill didn't throw a lot because it's their identity. Now, if they were more balanced or they won a great running team and they just tried to hide Tannehill, that would upset me. But this is the identity that the leading rushers, Derrick Henry is that dude. And they said, look, we're going to man up and, you know, run the ball. If you could stop us, stop us. And New England, they did at times when they needed to, but then the offense didn't capitalize. But other than that, the Tennessee just ran over them. And New England was New England. I mean, uh, some people say, oh, there's not enough weapons, that's firepower. They look good to me. Look, Tom Brady, the uh, offensive coaching staff, uh, it moves. They know exactly where to hit you. 
that's the thing that makes Tom great when people ask all these questions. It's like they know he's at a point where he knows where everything's at and they're going to put people in every spot. So once the play um, starts and you show what your alignment is or where your defense is, he's going to go to the person that you're not covering. And it sounds simple, but that's a lot to process in a short amount of time. And so I still think the offense can do what it do, and it definitely was enough to win. It was a one-point game all the way up to the last play, so let's not forget that. But um, Tennessee made some big plays, so you got to hand it off to them. That defense is very underrated. A lot of underrated defense. Well, I would say Tennessee and Buffalo um, are two underrated defense that might be better than the other defenses. All right, so New Orleans, Minnesota, that was a hell of a game. That was a hell of a game. Absolutely loved every second of it. Um, This, now, there was some penalties um, that kind of, you know, shaped things a little bit. But for the most part, this was a a, a tit-for-tat game. This was good defense, um, good offense on both sides. It wasn't, like, sloppy. It was just really everybody's giving a good punch. And so I really enjoyed it. I mean, to see Minnesota really get into New Orleans like that, but then to see New Orleans switch it up and let uh, Taysom Hill get into them like that, it was just – it was a good back-and-forth game. And Kirk Cousins with a, with a hell of a play to walk off for the uh, win. That was just a perfect throw. And people are crying about the push off. Dude, everyone does that. Everybody. Like on the Saints, everybody does it. And so they need to just stop. If it hasn't been emphasized throughout the year, then you, you're you not going to see them start doing it in the playoffs. So, uh you know how it is on those one-on-one end zone matchups. That's how that goes. So that was a good game. Seattle Philly was a little disappointing. I thought Seattle was really going to rock Philly, but Philly came to play. Their defense was a lot more effective than I expected them to be against Seattle. And Carson Wentz going down sucks because now you had a what if. And honestly, it's not like the Eagles were doing anything before he got hurt. And Josh McCown had a little bit of a rhythm. And so naturally people were like, well, if that was Carson Wentz, it'd be even better. That's what ifs. We don't know. But you, that's why I like to see the top competition. So then we don't have to ask those questions. But since he's hurt, people are always going to ask those questions. Um, hopefully he's all right. Seems like it might be some concussion related. Uh, we'll see. Um, I'm not sure. Uh exactly what happened to him uh, I mean I saw the hit but it was like right in his back so at first I thought it was his back I didn't think about his head but uh, they're saying it, he went for a concussion protocol and he didn't come back so hopefully he's okay um, but that kind of changed the game a little bit um, but like I said Josh McCown was still moving the ball they were running the ball well so now I'm worried about Seattle's defense a little more than I was before but definitely big up to Philly, it's defense. They, uh, as, as good as Russell Wilson is and as good as that offense is, and that O-line is just not great. Like, I could only imagine if they had talent on that O-line, how good this team would be. And they got Marshawn Lynch. You know, you lost three running backs. And so it's still impressive what Seattle did. Um, but they were handicapped a little bit more by that defense than I thought they were going to be. So, uh, good games. As far as the picks now, and if something changes, I might change. But Titans, unfortunately, you eliminated New England, felt good, but uh, you got to go against Baltimore. Now, I will say this. I The one good thing is I think the divisional round is better because the Titans won. Because if the Patriots won... They were going to play the Chiefs, and that would have been a good game. But Texans would have played the Ravens, and that would have been a blowout. We already seen them blow the Texans out. Texans struggled against Buffalo, and they ain't even half of what the Ravens about to bring offensively. So I was like, dude, Texans and Buffalo are fighting to get blown out by the Ravens. But the Titans won, and with Vrabel – with the defensive pieces they got, 
I think it'll be more interesting to see them against the Ravens than the uh, Texans defense. Not to say that they're going to stop them, but if you ask me who had a better chance, I would say the Titans have a better chance to um, hold up against the Ravens offense than the Texans did. So those both of those games get more interesting because Chiefs-Texans, I think Texans have a chance against the Chiefs. I don't think they're going to win but they have a better chance than they did against the Ravens. So um, I'm taking Ravens and Chiefs in the AFC. I'm going chalk there. 49ers and Vikings is going to be interesting. Actually, oh, yeah, Vikings won. They were six seed. I thought it was going to be Seattle. Um, Minnesota 49ers. I don't know, man. Minnesota is pretty good. It's going to fall down to Jimmy G. And they just played up to snuff with um, Drew Brees. Uh, But Kirk Cousins is going to be under fire. I don't know, man. I'm going to take 49ers slightly. I still think it's going to be a close game. Uh, Seattle, Green Bay, that's going to be crazy. But at this point, Green Bay is pretty healthy. I think Green Bay is going to win that one. So, So, uh. Yeah, I stayed chalked the whole way through, actually. So there we go. That's my predictions uh, going forward. And then lastly, uh, Tua has declared for the NFL. Um, for me, I think it makes it interesting. I don't know the medicals and all that. Um, there was a lot of reports that he really wanted to stay in college and all that. And I have not watched a whole lot of Tua. I'm going to tell you this. From the little I have watched, I'm not as impressed as everybody. They're talking about top five pick. Honestly, don't see that. Um, but I've watched very little, so we'll see how I land on it once I get into the draft. But either way, it makes the draft a lot more interesting because I think the quarterbacks is real. what is really going to throw a monkey wrench in this because the above and away talent is on the line, offense and defense. Next up, you have like this crazy receiver class, and that that's really what this draft is. But the quarterbacks, as always, are going to get pushed up, and I think the more that we have, the more that this draft is going to get topsy-turvy. And so it seems like the all the quarterbacks we thought would go in the draft are going to be there. So this is uh, going to make things interesting in the first round, so. All right, that's it for me. Feels like my voice is going out. Um, but go to the comment section. Let me know what you think about any of that. Share it around. Get the conversation started. Thumbs up, subscribe, and thank you for listening.